she's so fluffy and soft. She is. She oh, she is. She, she is, is really. Yes, yes, she did. Did, did you groom her? Oh, pretty, pretty no. We she she went elsewhere. But I did <laughs> wash her her harness. Oh yeah, yeah. Good boy. yeah so good boy. yeah, so it, 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 yeah, it, so she I did something. I didn't, but uh, yeah, Debbie is. There's no way Debbie's going to let me get close to her with clippers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at me. <laughs> oh, <my gosh. laughs> Don't have much experience. Yeah, I have very little experience. Uh, <laughs> and if it wasn't for Debbie, Lord knows what she would look like. She'd, right now, she'd be about this big. <laughs> Just a big <laughs> puffball. Puff uh, it, it, it wouldn't be wouldn't be pretty at all. All right, so we're we're ending ending Romans. Um, and where did we start? How did we start with Romans? We're all idolaters. We're all <laughs> idolaters. Yes, we all worship idols. Uh, therefore, we all need to hear the gospel. We need to hear the gospel, and we've talked about how we, you know, that, and how are Christians. Uh, idolaters? How does Paul, why does he say that the Gentile Christians in this Gentile church that's trying to figure out how to live in a world with Christian Jews as well, how, how does he say that uh, Gentile Christians worship idols? We're judgmental. We are judgmental. You know, when we're judgmental, we're putting ourselves in God's position. And therefore, it shows that uh, we worship we worship the creature just like uh, folks that worship sticks and bushes and, and that kind of jazz. Uh, only the creature we worship is... Ourselves. We tend to worship ourselves. Oh, oh uh, I yeah, know we do worship. About, I talk after when I've done reform theology. I talk about being under a glass dome. Humanity's under a glass dome, and we try to find God. And what we find when we look up is us. Us. a reflection us. of ourselves. Why do and, you feel uh, we have to judge? Well, what I think what Paul would say is remember, good question. Let me ask you why? Why do you think? Why do you think uh, we have a tendency to judge? What, what do you think Paul would say based on what we've seen in Romans? What do you think Paul would say if someone asked him why do we judge so much? What do you think Paul would say? You're not supposed to, for one thing. Well, he, he, that's not something we're supposed to do, but why do we do Your question was really, why do we do it? Yeah. Why, why, why do you think Paul, and I think when we got that, I think we got a pretty good idea of why we do, do you, it, I think. Do you think we do it to make ourselves feel better? Well, it, that may be, but I think Paul would say there's something more fundamental. Do we do it because we think what... We think is right is right. And okay. If they think All right. Wrong. Wrong. Which is idolatry, right? Right. Because if I think what I believe is right because I think so. I believe it. Yes. Uh, therefore, and because I believe it, God, God must God must believe God. it. And and I'll tell you, you know, that sounds. You, when I say it, like you know, it sounds. Oh, we know if people do, people do it. Oh. Lot, I mean, maybe to a certain extent we all do it. I think there are a lot of times I do it because I, th I think it, that must be what God, God thinks. God, we think the same. Yeah, you know, because I'm a I'm godly person, therefore, you know, what I think. And, and what I think what Paul would say is that that's part of sin. And remember, Paul viewed sin in a way that's a little different than we view sin. How did Paul view, how did Paul view sin? Because we think of often we think of sin as doing naughty things. Sin is doing bad things or doing things contrary to God. And Paul, I think, would say, yet yeah, that's a sign of sin or the result of sin or a consequence of sin. But he wouldn't say, I don't think he would say that's sin. Paul seems to view sin as a, like an independent force that almost like inhabits us. Like the devil grabbing a hold of you. Exactly. Exactly. And and I've said that with a lot of couples, you know, in counseling. You know, I don't care how you visualize the devil. It doesn't matter. You know, understand, he's alive and well and working on you. And if you want to see him as a, as a person, if you want to see him as part of your brain, if you want to see him as... I don't care. You know, I don't care. But understand, 
You're being manipulated and used in ways that you may not even realize. And I think that's what Paul, how Paul sees sin. And you they know. do it, you do it from such an early age. You set your baby in front of the TV watching cartoons and they're the little devil. Well, it, and, and so and, they form. <laughs> And it's something, it's something part of us. That's, it's, it's, it's a force that causes us to do what you just described, which is, which is the idolatry that Christians need to be aware of. Maybe more than, you know, doing, doing drugs or doing, you know, committing adultery and stealing and killing. You know, maybe that's not the thing that Christians are most tempted to do. Maybe we're far more tempted to worship gods other than the Lord God which is kind of putting ourselves into that position. Maybe that's the great temptation that, that Christians face. Maybe. I think Paul would say, yeah, because of the way he structures it. So if sin is this independent force that kind of inhabits us and causes us, over which we have really no, very little control over that force, you know, because it's something that's just there, who, who is the only one that can have control over that force? It's Holy Spirit. It's God. God's the only one. And so we, we are, for Paul, by our nature, sinful. We commit sins. And, and John Calvin said the same. We sin in our best efforts. So if, regardless of what we do, sin is somehow involved in it. Well, and it, there are parts in the Bible in it where God tells you um, it's sort of like a judgment in a way. You shouldn't deal with... Uh, um, some people that are really you know, doing bad things. Say. Sure, absolutely. So and, that's sort of a judgment, right? Well, and we're going to see at the end of this letter something that's like that too. So Paul's not, Paul's, what, what I think Paul is trying to say is that we are sinful. And some of the judgment that we make as we live in this world is necessary to make. You know, if I'm dealing with somebody who is a, a mass killer, or is a, is a thief, or is abusing children, or something like that. I don't think Paul said, oh, don't say anything. You know, don't, 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 don't say anything. Don't, don't call the police. That would be judgment, and you're sinning. Paul, I think Paul would say, what are you, stupid? Yes. You've got to do something about this, because we live in a sinful world. Yes. And so this is what we do. But when we do that, I, I think Paul would say, don't assume this is some kind of sinless act, because you're still doing you're putting yourself in God's position. That may be something we have to do from time to time to exist in this world. It doesn't mean that we have sort of transcended what is uh, and moved into what is divine. You know? So it's sort of like a necessary evil that we've got, got to do. I think that's kind of how Paul would see it. But he sees that as a sign that sin is in, that affects us all. Now, for Paul, what does God, though, desire with us? So that's who we are. We are, we are by our nature, sinful, and even when we do good things, you know, that sin, self-interest is, is involved. I mean, it's just what we do, who we are. What does, what does Paul say God desires with us? His relationship. relationship. God desires relationship with this, with this creature that he made. Um, and what's interesting is I don't think Paul goes into depth on why sin exists, which is kind of interesting, because he says, well, sin is a result of da-da-da-da-da. He doesn't do that. It's just, it's there, and you know it's there because you do it, uh, and when you look at your life, you see that you sin. Um, don't you think that if you knew the why, you wouldn't Accept responsibility. We would probably. I think that's a good point. We would probably explain it away. You know, I we. Can't hope. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, it's, then we're justifying ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we use it. We, we. Well, what Paul would say is that sin that's within us would would cause us to think that way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and yeah, I think you're right. I think that's a that's a great. That's what we would do. And when you get right down to it, it's not relevant. You know, why we do it is irrelevant, we just got to deal with it. And so Paul, say, Paul says God desires relationship. Since we're sinful, that's going to be a problem with God having a relationship with us because relationship demands what? Uh, Act, you know, action and response. And God's action is easy. What does God do? 
that what is his action towards us? Forgive us. Forgive us. He's, what are some, compassionate towards us. He loves us. He's gracious towards us. All of that is flowing from God, and that's easy. I mean, that's coming from God. You know, so God can take care of that. The problem with to have a relationship, there's got to be a response on our part, right? You know, and that's where we get all gummed up because... God has to give us faith. Yeah, yeah, we're sinful. And God wants us to just trust. And you we know. have to open up to him. That's all he, well, all he wants us to say is to trust what he's already done. That's it. You know, that's it. Doesn't want us to, to believe doctrine. Doesn't want us to, to follow law. Doesn't want us to do that stuff. All he wants us to do is say, I trust that you love me. That's it. What gets in the way? Ourselves. We get in the way. And in particular, what? Sin gets in the way. And so when we do that, we immediately start getting off the rails, right? So God's going to not only love us to establish relationship with us, he's got to do what? Or he chooses to do what? He chooses to give us the faith. He choo- yes, gives us the ability to have the, to have the faith. Okay? And how, what, what does he, how does he do that? Because we've got sin that's there. What does he do about the sin? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ dies. Boom. Dies for sin. We died in the cross. And under, understand when I think, and we're going to see this in Genesis too, when we look at Genesis, I, I, what Paul is trying to, is doing is conveying ideas to human beings. And I, I'm going to speak only for myself, for nobody else in the room. My knowledge is really limited. I am really limited in my knowledge. Uh, You know, it really is. Uh, Therefore, if you're going to explain to me something, you better use small words. You know, you better talk to me, especially if it involves anything mechanical. If you're going to tell me how to fix something, use small words and pretend like you're speaking to someone who knows no English. You mean no just what you <laughs> yes, yes. Don't, don't give me the technical name for a tool. I will not know it. But because I'm a male, I'm going to, when you tell me that technical name, a name You're going to I'm going to do name. this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I have sort of like I do when, when I'm talking to the doctor or an, an accountant or a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Uh, but I, I'm not going to say, what does that mean? Because uh, then they're going to later laugh at me. So, uh, you, so that's, that's me. I think that's humanity. We are, we are really limited. So God's got to speak to us in a way that we can understand. Because if he's speaking to us in a way we don't understand, then he's, he's, he's kind of wasting time, right? So he's going to speak to us in, in very limited ways you know, very clear language. And, and he's doing it through a human being who is also limited, you know, who is also trying to understand these, you know, the, how do you understand the eternal? How can the finite understand the eternal? You know, how can the limited understand the infinite? Well, you can't. You know, you can't. And some of the, how some do you of the... understand unconditional life? Yeah, how can you understand unconditional anything? Because <laughs> you know, we live in a conditional world. Everything we, we do is conditional. Um, you know, based on, because, you know, our love is, a, is object-centered, not subject-centered. We can't grasp that. So Paul has to tell us in ways that we can understand, but that he can also understand. And so he gives us, it talks about Jesus. Jesus Christ deals with the sin because, according to Paul, what does Jesus do? Forgive. He dies, Forgive. and for Paul, this is really, really how he sees the cross. Jesus dies on the cross, death breaks the power of sin, and we died in him. We were on the cross with Jesus. Now, that's how Paul sees it. Now, is that how every Christian in the Bible sees it? And no. Is that how every Christian in history has seen it? And no. Because they're trying to understand the same mystery that Paul is, is trying to explain. The, the, the point is, through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. How they became forgiven, he's got images. You know, in one, Paul uses the cross, and he talks about marriage, and he talks about inheritance, and all kinds of jazz to help us understand how we are forgiven. The key is that 
through Christ, then as he's working with us, giving us the ability to respond in faith, he kind of try, he knocks out that sin part by having the forgiveness or participating in the death of Christ. Boom. That's taken care of. And therefore, we are now sinless, right? No. No. And how do we know we're not sinless? Because we still sin. Because we still sin. And Paul says that, remember, in the seventh chapter. You know, after all dealing with all this stuff about how Jesus breaks the power of sin and we are now free to free from sin, we no longer should serve sin as a master. We should serve God as a master. Then he comes to the seventh chapter and says, Oh, wretched man. But, yeah. <laughs> can't do it. You know, I know what to do. I know what's good. I know what's right and wrong. Sure. But you know what? I do what's wrong. I, I, I just do. In fact, the more I'm sure I know what's right, it's wrong. the more I do what's wrong. You know, which shows that even though through Christ we died with Him and therefore sin in one sense is broken. The reality is, it's it's still sin is still whether it's residual or something is still there. Again, for Paul, doesn't matter. You know, doesn't matter why it's still there. It is. So, what does Paul do? How does he deal? How does God deal with that? Because that's still blocking our way to have this relationship. God has done His part. We're trying to do our part. God is helping us. As do our part. How does he help us further? Bang, Holy Spirit. So even if you can't do it, Spirit does. So you end up with this relationship with God, but don't deceive yourself. You're doing it not because you deserve it, but because oh, you, can. Oh, you can. Therefore, don't run around and tell other people how they can or should. She had to miss me. <laughs> she missed. She didn't miss. Uh, but so don't don't run around saying that. Instead, be grateful for what God has done. And what is God doing for the entire human race, including the Jews? Loving us and forgiving. He remember the the big thing with the Jews. Well, what is God going to do with the Jews? Well, you know something. We are we are hunks of clay, yep. and hunks of clay don't determine what kind of pot they're going to be. A hunk of clay. It becomes whatever the potter chooses. And you know what? We ain't the potter. Nope. Who's the potter? Jesus. God's a potter. God's a potter. And that's what God's going to do what God's going to do. And that would cause us to go, oh my gosh, that's terrible. That's like telling the Greeks, Zeus is going to do what Zeus is going to do. And the Greeks do this. Oh no, that's horrible. Tomorrow he may send a flood. You know, the next day he may send spring. I don't know because Zeus changes his mind so much. But Paul says, wait a minute, we know something about our God that these Greeks running around don't know about theirs. We know our God is loving, loving, and loving to what's love. mercy Faithful. and compassion. Mercy and compassion. That's the will of God. Our God's will is always mercy and compassion. And, and therefore, we can accept that God is in charge because He's going to he show is. us. He is, and, and he's going to show us mercy and compassion. That shouldn't. We don't need to be afraid of that. That's good news. Mm -hmm. And therefore, since God's will is mercy and compassion, and God made all these promises to the Jews, God is not going to send the Jews to burn in eternal hell. At least not according to what Paul says, because God is going to be merciful and compassionate to them. You know, and therefore, as Gentiles, that's not something we should allow to get in the way. Because God is in, in control. Now, that's the relationship. It's almost like, you know, kind of do the best you can. Uh, but understand, it's all about God. It isn't about you or us. Not about us. It's about God. So we trust. We just trust. You know, even though our trust is going to be incomplete and really inadequate, that's okay because it's about God. And God is merciful and compassionate. Now, that's wonderful. we got a relationship with God, right? And what word does Paul use to describe that relationship? Righteousness. righteousness. We are in a righteous relationship with God. Now, so what? How does that change what I do tomorrow? How does that change what I do tomorrow? It all depends what the first thought in your mind is when you get up. Oh, that's exactly right. What, what does Paul say? 
Well put, Van. What does Paul say should be the first thought when we get up in the morning? Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Well, that's a good thought. Hmm. After you thank Jesus, what does Paul want to be our first thought in terms of what we do that day? Uh, we'll align with his. Chapter 12, verse 1. That we should be living sacrifices. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. sacrifice yeah. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. You know, that's your first, that's your first thought. How can I be a living sacrifice? How can I be given everything God has already done? And I had no control over that. That was God. He gave everything to you. Boom. Now, how am I going to use it? You know, it's like going into a machine shop, have the best equipment on earth in that machine shop. Somewhere down the line, you got to decide. The machinist has to decide what, he's gonna make. what I'm going to make, what I'm going to do with it. You know, having all that equipment is worth Nothing. squat Nothing. if you don't use it. Right. You know, and here God's given us all this thing, and what are we going to do about it? We present ourselves a living sacrifice. Well, that makes it clear, right? Everybody knows what that means. No. <laughs> So what does Paul say? Because again, that's an image. Like I said, fascinating that Paul uses sacrificial images, not with Jesus, but with us. You know, every, other places in the New Testament, Jesus is a sacrifice. That's not Paul. Paul's not, is that, that's not in Paul. Paul's saying we are the sacrifice. You know, the sacrificial image rests on us. So how do we do this? How do we come, become living sacrifices? I well, ultimately, what, what becomes the one four-letter word that guides living sacrifices? Love. I'm glad you chose that one because it's on tape. Uh, it could have been really bad. Uh, you know, could have been really bad if you... Because <laughs> Kenyans, be, Kenyans may be listening to it. Uh, you know, stop! Stop! Uh, the... Um, so we, we love, right? And Paul talks about that in the 12th chapter. You know, we are called to love one another. You know, love one another. Well, I'm experiencing deja vu all over again. We're called to, who else said love one another? Jesus. Uh, Jesus said it. Uh, Moses said it. You know, throw a dart, you're going to hit somebody that said it. Uh, so, you know, well, that would be a bad thing to do. That wouldn't be a loving thing to do to throw a dart. Uh, but uh, be a, so love, you, you love one another. Well, all right, that's great. I'm going to be loving. <laughs> well, what does that mean? What does, it, what does it mean to be loving? What does it mean to be loving inside the body? Inside the body of Christ. Encouraging. Ah, we, we encourage, we build people up. We encourage. For Paul, what's, what is the most important thing that we can do within the body to show love? It's the first thing he really deals with once he gets past, you know, kind of definition of love. How can, how can I be Loving to my brothers and sisters Helping. in the body, huh? Helping. I can. I, okay. Not okay. Judging. Good. Not judging. Lit, not judging. Not judging. Helping. But if I'm helping, um, you had a water problem yeah. at your house, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I wish you'd called me. <laughs> she goes. Um, I could have come over uh -huh. and, and helped you. Yeah. With that. You probably would have prayed over my well. Well, I would have, I would have prayed over your well. And, and that would have meant what? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, you know, pr probably, well, I could, no. I well, I mean, that's right, that's right. It could have, could have made you different. You know, but um, I, I uh, wanted to help you by uh, fixing it. Because I'd, I'd have gotten one of those, one of those big, what are those big things called that you put on a, on a bolt? And a wrench. wrench. A wrench. Yeah, I could have gotten a, a wrench, and and you know uh, uh, a a screwdriver. Uh, Phillips, right? There's a Phillips. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. 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 And straight blade star, and you got a whole bunch of them, boyfriend. I'm just going to get a screwdriver and a hammer and a wrench, and I'm going to fix that thing. Okay. Now, would you be would you be wise? 
saying, yes, I would love for you to know you'd be stupid. Uh, That would be a dumb thing to do, right? That would be the worst thing in the world to do. Therefore, if I'm going to be helpful, and I'm not going to stand and say to to judge somebody who is fixing it, because I, I know I could get a wrench and Probably breaks the line. <laughs> <laughs> what what is what is really important before I start stepping out and trying to help people? Know what Find out what you're I need to know what your gift is. I need, right. I need to know my gifts. And that's why Paul goes through, you know, before he really is saying... But what if you, you don't know your gifts? Well, oh, that's the oh, now that becomes really interesting. Mm-hmm. If you don't know your gifts. What you do you ask think? God. Oh, well, you, we, yeah, I was going to... Van, you're jumping ahead. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> well, how, do we, how, do we find, how do we find our gifts? One, we, we can ask God to help us find it. What else can we do to find our gifts? Ask the gifts people. that we have. Ask other people. You know, especially people that you, that you respect and trust. You know, people you respect and trust. Man, you ask them... What do you think I do well? They're going to tell you. Talk. You know, they're going to tell you. You know, if you respect them. I mean, yeah. some people, you know, people you don't respect, who knows what they're going to tell you. But, you know, <laughs> people that you respect will tell you what you can do. And they'll tell you, I'll tell you, they'll, they'll let you know what you don't do well. Uh, you know, my wife, she knows. <laughs> don't give him a, what do they call that thing? Wrench. A wrench. <laughs> don't give him a wrench. You know, because he's going to break it. You know, and a hammer. Heaven forbid, don't give him a hammer and set him loose because he's going to break it. Uh, you know, so my wife will tell you what my gifts are and, and definitely are what my are. gifts are. Uh, and she, remember, well, she's it's also. It's important to know both. She, yes, that's exactly. It's, but you know, I think sometimes we're given a gift that we don't really have. Because right. the need is there. Sure, but sure, you can't sure, do it sure, again. Sure. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and, and it's kind of relative, too. You know, uh-huh. if, if you're surrounded by me, you know, you take anybody that can use tools. You know, anybody, because you know, most people could fix things better than me. You know, take them. You know, don't look, don't look to me. So all of a sudden, but if you're in a group of auto mechanics, you know, they're much better to fix your car. Yeah. You know, but there are people between them and me, a lot of people, and you, you know, might want to go to them. But we got to know, we got to know the gifts and talents. And if we don't know what our gifts and talents are, then we need to, find out. we need to find out. And, and, you know, maybe that's one of the things the church needs to do, take seriously, you know, is help people identify the gifts and talents that they have. And, and you talk about judgment. And this is where, again, we're living in a, in a world, a sinful world, although the judgment, has, I think, has more to do with moral and ethic. But, you know, it, it's, it's okay to tell somebody. You know, God didn't give you the gift of singing. Oh, yeah. you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, that's not, maybe that's not God's gift to you. You really <laughs> like doing it, but maybe, you know, and, and somebody you respect will tell you that. Um, when you say, you know, I'm going out for the musical, or I'm going to sing a solo. They don't need um, to tell me. I tell them if yeah. they sit around me that I can't carry a tune. So, <laughs> so but, it's, but everybody has, Paul says everybody has gifts, because he even says, what, what gifts does he, even in Romans, what gifts does he include? Healing. Yeah, well, healing. You know, healing, preaching, that kind of stuff. Oh, well. uh, serving. Yeah, encouraging. Teaching. You know, encur- giving. Talking, giving up your time. Giving up your time. So it, if you made a list, it would be almost infinite. Almost you know, of gifts. Yeah, because there's so many gifts that we have. And, and we have them. And so not only do we need to develop them, I mean, give them, uh, to identify them, we need to develop them too, right? Because if I've got a gift and it is undeveloped, then... Then it's not of any value at all to anybody. And so Paul, I think Paul would say, you, we got to identify them, then we got to develop them, and then we got to use them, because if we don't use them, it isn't, isn't worth it. They die. Yeah, they die. Now, John Calvin had the same, he talked, this was what he said about vocation, same thing Paul said. And that he, what he would say is no vocation is higher than others, which is a change from what 
the earlier church believed because they were Christian vocations. So being a priest was a higher calling than being something else. And John, one of the things John Calvin said is no, no, no. You know, being a mediocre priest when you could be a really good carpenter is stupid. You know, God gave you the gift to be a carpenter. Be the best carpenter you can be. Don't be a mediocre uh, minister or priest. That doesn't make sense that all vocations are equal on the same level. The difference is function, not status. You know, someone higher than others. And I think that's something else Christians need because sometimes, and again, Sorry, because we we're, we're idolaters. You know, we, and we judge good and bad, but both are judgments. And so we assume that somebody doing this is clearly more spiritual. Well, you know, not if they're not good at it. You know, maybe they should reconsider. Uh, and that's okay, because we're finding gifts that we use. That's how we love one another. we got to identify it. Okay, how else can we love one another? So we, we help people, we love people by, by using the gifts that we have. What else, is going, what else in the body? You know, let's get even more. What, how about outside the body? How should we be dealing with the, with the state? We should be obeying. State. Yeah, we should certainly, if the state is, is, if the state is punishing evil, and rewarding good, we need to we we need we need to obey the we need to be obey the state. And even if it's not, we need to recognize that if you break the law, you pay the you pay the consequences. And that's the way it is. You know that's what he says inside the body. You know we should be obeying the law. We should also not be putting our little detaily judgmental things up as. As, as part of the law. Yeah, as part of the law. Sorry. You know that you know when he talks about eating vegetables or keeping kosher or or one day above another. You you got to get rid of that stuff if it's causing the church to so have to, to to have division and if it's causing Christians to either judge others or to mock others. And if that's if that's what's happening, we got to put that garbage away. Yeah. Well, like Jesus, because it's Jesus not said, clear. pay to Caesar what is Caesar's and pay, pay to God what is God. Absolutely. So the same thing. Absolutely. Okay, so Paul, all of that is what Paul has said in Romans. Man, y'all know it. Boom. You know, let's close it. Chapter 16. Right in chapter 16, uh, Paul is closing this letter by giving some greetings and teaching. Who's the first person? Phoebe. He greets Phoebe. And who is Phoebe? What do we know about Phoebe? She's a servant. She a servant. is a... Servant in the church. What kind of servant? Deacon. A, a deacon? How do you get deacon? Where do you see deacon? Well, because she's a servant. That's in oh. Greek. That's the, the Greek word. Okay. Uh, she's a... Well, all saying it. She's a, she's a sister. She She's a... She's of the female persuasion, not only of the male yeah. persuasion. Now, it's interesting because he says um, he's commending her, the sister uh, Phoebe to them. What would it appear as though Paul is doing with respect to Phoebe? Introducing her. Yeah, introduce. So he said her. Yeah, Phoebe's coming from the outside in. Get them to accept her. Yes, telling them to accept her. Now, think about this. Because I think this is pretty important. The first person Paul talks about sending to Rome is a, is a woman. Is a woman. You know, that's pretty, that, that would be fairly dramatic now. It was really a big deal 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. oh. You didn't. Women didn't have any stats. Well, although although Roman women were in better shape than Hebrew women. Hebrew women had nothing. Yeah. They had no status. Roman women were a little... I mean, Roman women could own property. Roman women could divorce. Roman women were, had acknowledged rights. But if they were sending but, her to Rome, mm -hmm. then she wasn't a Roman woman. She, she wasn't, but she could have been great. Yeah, but she she was but it, but the fact that even that as a woman is is pretty dramatic and and Paul is too intentional for this to be an accident, you know. So I think he knows exactly what he's doing yeah. when he he says and and um, how how should they treat her? Give her help. 
Why she needs. Okay, they they should help her. Include her. Right. They should include her, and why should they help her? Because she's worthy of the Lord. Yep. Of the respect. Worthy of the respect, because what has she done? What does Paul know she's done? He helped a lot of people. Yeah, he's, she's helped a lot of people, including him. him. You know, so he's sending her first one. Second two, interesting. Priscilla. Priscilla. Prisca and, and Aquila. And um, same same kind of deal because he's telling them to greet him. Right? Two Girl people. Gets to be first. Again, we got a woman first. We got the woman listed with listed first. Don't, don't you think mostly most of the time it's the women who really believe be, you know, I mean they're 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 more apt to believe and follow as opposed well, to the men at first. It it it's it certainly would would seem to be I think Paul would be sort of suggesting that. And and remember Paul's letters are are, are practical. Uh, because he's writing to churches that are facing issues. Uh, so it, that would s sure seem to be part of Paul's experience. Um, I, I think the, the Romans, and this is also what se separates Romans from Jews, the, and Greeks, this is, a, this, is, this is a Greek characteristic, that when Greek does word order, like in sentences, they'll put the most important first, uh, always do. In, in Greek sentences, you know what's important by looking at what comes first, first in the sentence. And if it's the verb that's most important, the, the verb action. will be first. You know, if the action is most important, and it usually is, that's first. But if the subject is most important, there'll be a subject. If the object is most important, there'll be an object. That's, that's what you're going to see. That's what you're going to see in, in, in Greek. And that may be what's happening here. It could be that Prisca just had more money, that she had more status in society than Aquila, her husband. And so that's why she was first. The fact, though, that Paul would do that shows that he certainly isn't anti. Person. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's not anti-woman. And so and they saved his life. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. Then he starts, he tells them to greet others, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a whole mess of people. And we're not gonna talk about every one of those because there's a bunch of them. Uh, now, when you look at, at all of those people that are listed, what do they have in common? That they're at, helping the church or him. They are helping the church or him. And in helping the church, who who are they helping? They're helping God. So Christ becomes kind of the focus on, on all, of, all of these. And, and what does he encourage the Roman church to offer them, these, these people? Watch out for division. Well, hold on that for a second. He tells them to greet one another with a holy kiss. Mm -hmm. you know, that, yes. So uh, therefore, what is, why would Paul devote so much space? Because remember, we talked about papyrus is really expensive. You know, and he's devoting a lot of space here on greeting. You know, there are 14 greetings here. You know, that's a lot of greetings. Why would he devote or more? There's, there's 16, counting the first two. How many, why is he devoting all, why do you think he's devoting all this space to, to greeting? Because we should be welcoming we everybody. Should, okay, we should be welcoming, which means welcoming may be part of being a living sacrifice, showing love, being a living sacrifice. Okay, so he, t he talks about that. Now, as he gets to, so we finish with these greetings, uh, verse 17, he offers some final instructions, his final instructions. And what, what is the last instruction in 17 that he, he offers? Keep away from those who cause... Um, division. Keep away from those who are causing divisions. Okay. That requires a judgment. That requires. That's what I was. That's what I was saying. That that requires mm -hmm. a judgment. And what does he say? They the Romans can use to determine because if if I come into a place. I may create divisions without doing it with malice. 
And he doesn't say those who are evildoers, but people who are causing divisions or offenses. What does Paul offer the Roman church as a way to determine if a person is just taking action or creating divisions? What does he encourage them to use as a standard? The Bible or the teachings. Okay, the teachings of who? Of God, the peace. That you have learned. That you have learned. The, the teachings that you have learned. Where have they learned the teachings? From Paul. From Paul. You know, so what, what I have told you you can use as a standard. So if you want, because you're right, you make a judgment. That's your standard to engage by. That becomes, that becomes a set of standards, right? And that you can use that, and if somebody is violating what I taught, and, it's cre- and that's creating issues in the church, what should you do? Put them out of the church. You should put, you, or at the very least, avoid them. You, you got to avoid that. That stuff. Now, in the Roman Church, he's he's talked about some folks that are causing divisions, and and although he's kind of been very gentle with them. And what was one instance where people were causing divisions when divisions were happening in the Roman Church? About what they ate. About what they ate and the day is, the, you know, what day is important. That was causing divisions in the church. But he was very gentle, so he doesn't know this church. We know, uh, therefore, he's not specific. But in other letters, he really is. You know, when he writes to the Corinthians, he is really specific about people. Yeah, you can't live with your mother-in-law. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't be running running around with her. You know, Lord have mercy. I don't even want to think about it. Uh, But yeah, it it is it is a bad it's bad news in the Galatian church. So the Corinthians are running crazy, and he tells them, "You got to stop." You gotta stop being crazy. Su- they're suing one another, taking one another to court. Man, you gotta stop that nonsense. Speaking, speaking in tongues so badly and loudly that folks, cro- you know, across the street are saying, "Man, they are drunk in there. They are, they are boozing it up in there." Nobody acts like that unless they've been drinking heavy. And the Corinthians, they knew about heavy drinking, you know. So yeah, he said, "You gotta stop being crazy." The, Gr- the Galatians, just the opposite. You know, they, they had groups in there saying, if you want to be a Christian, believe in Jesus Christ. If you want to be a Christian first class, believe in Jesus Christ and obey, obey the Jewish law. <gasps> then you're a Christian first class. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, and that's what they were saying. Well, and they were, and, and they were Christians. They were preaching it too. They were preaching it and... Peter seemed to believe. Paul says Peter kind of kind of went on that side. Yeah, and he had to chew him out, chew Peter out. Uh, but those were issues. And, and, and even Paul in Galatians will say, if anybody comes with a message contrary to what I taught you, and I taught you about grace, 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 anybody comes with a message contrary to what I taught you, even if it is an angel from heaven, Double curse. big wings, even if it's me, Yep. Boom. Get them out. They're lying to you. You know, wow. But that's how he, that's a standard he gives. So if you want to know who's causing trouble and who's not, that means we've got a responsibility to do what? We have a responsibility to check what people say. Yeah, we got to, we got to listen to what people say. Yeah, find out the truth. Well, we, yeah, we got to find out what they're actually saying. Uh, we got to find out what they're actually teaching. Um, how does he describe these people? That smooth talk. They they are they are smooth talkers. In reality, though, what? Serving their own. Yeah, they're, they're not serving. They're not serving. Christ is serving themselves. Okay. So, but to identify them, you need to know what Paul taught. Because who is susceptible? <laughs> who is susceptible to these smooth talkers? Those who don't have a strong faith. Well, he even goes for he the, yeah people that are naive well, I the, 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 the 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 simple minded you okay. know those who they're the ones that are going to be susceptible and and you know I, I I'm kind of glad he said that you because know, it's interesting if you believe you're not simple minded you are simple minded 
Because you, you set yourself up for the fall. Yep. Yep. Well, what if you can be, um, what is it? What did you say? Simple minded? What was the other thing? Naive. 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 The naive is me. Simple minded, I don't think I am. Well, Paul, remember, same. Jesus says, when he sends his disciples out, he says, be uh, wise as serpents and as doves. And, and I think that's, that's really powerful. And that's kind of what Paul is saying. You know, that smooth talkers, and we don't see that in our society at all. Oh, smooth not. talkers make a lot of promises, you know, get people to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, we never see that. Uh, the, um, but he says, you know, how, you know how you deal with it? You know how you deal with smooth talkers? Learn. Learn, learn, learn. Learn, learn. You want to know smooth talkers in the church who are going to lead you astray, and they will? Learn. The more you know, the less influence they'll have. He Guarantee the less influence they'll have. He commended the Bereans for checking everything that he said. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's that's something with Paul. He he had a lot of confidence in what he he taught. He had no trouble people, you know, if there was a problem in it, he didn't have a problem with somebody saying, you know, sit down and talk. Now he'll explain why they were wrong, but you know, he'll still sit down with them. Um, yeah, if you if you if you want to be simple minded, you know, buy the bridge. Go ahead and buy that bridge. You know, <laughs> yeah. buy the you know, yeah, there are plenty of swamp land, plenty of swamp land in Arizona. You know, just waiting to be sold. Uh, unfortunately, it can cause a lot of divisions in the church when, when simple-minded people or people that are naive assume that someone who comes in and says, I believe in Jesus Christ. I am a witness to him. He is the center of my life. You know, and I want him to be the center of your life too. And all you have to do is write that check. And I'll send you that prayer call. You know, prayed over by me in person. You know... Man, how many people do that? And it's not because you know they're they're evil. It's just because they haven't maybe no. read the Bible, and there's nothing in the Scripture about people selling bread calls. You know, then maybe you want to think about it. You know, if it did like the great prophet uh, Judge um, Judy says, <laughs> if it doesn't sound right, it probably isn't. <laughs> you know. Uh, that's that's the way it is. Anyway, so Paul and kind of encourages. And those ones that get into politics. <laughs> well, I I think that it's I I think you can broaden this out. Yeah, I think you can you can broaden this out. You know, and say you know if you want to if you want to be a better voter, read. Don't look at bumper stickers. Read and read everybody, both sides. You know. I have, I have constant conversations with people, and it's fascinating, who don't know definitions of words. They use words, but they don't know what they mean. I know they don't know what they mean. I know, because I, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, but there are certain things I know what they mean, and because I know things like economics, because that's what I studied, I know what they mean, and they don't, they don't have a clue. If they had a clue, they wouldn't use it, because they're wrong, and the way they use it is wrong, but they use it. If we want to avoid that, Learn what the words mean. You know, <laughs> you know, learn what they mean. You know, and then we're in good shape. Then we'll be in better shape. Did you ever listen though to to little kids when they're talking? And they'll they'll put the right word in the right spot. Yes, Lang Oh, I think that's you amazing. You know what I mean? They just it's right there. It's exactly what you're talking about. They put the right word in the right spot. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I think it's, it fascinates me all the time is language acquisition. How children learn language. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how children learn language, uh, but it's amazing. Thing. Okay, Paul gives instructions. Don't be stupid. If you want to make better decisions, you know, study. Learn what I taught, and then you'll be able to judge people who are full of baloney. Uh, you know, and then you won't send them your life savings. I'll tell you, I'm never going to send another prince in, in Nigeria $5,000, you know, Burn me once or twice or three times, but I, that's, I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> What's, what are the last people Paul mentions? Who are the last people Paul mentions? Um. In verse 21. 
Timothy. He starts mentioning some, and well, as opposed to people who that he's sending that they'd agree, he telling them they say hi. Yeah, say because they're they're here with me. <laughs> you know, they're like this is like on a um, uh, FaceTime. Paul's like FaceTiming uh, the church, and you know, come on up here, Timothy. Let them see you. And, and so it's the people that are there, Timothy and these other guys. Now, what is Paul, by including them, because again, this is expensive. This is, this is not free, this space that he's using. What, what is Paul conveying to the Romans by including the, these folks that he says, say hi to, boom, 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 boom. What's, what's, he, what's he communicating to them? Unity. Talking about unity. He's talking about Unity, that the church is bigger than what's sitting in Rome. That you're part of something much bigger than just one little community that is meeting. Okay, now, ends the letter in verse 25 with, with a, uh, what's called a doxology, a word of praise, word of praise. And in this final doxology, verse 25, who, on whom is that doxology focused? Jesus, Jesus Christ. It, it is focused on Christ. It is focused on because God. It's focused on right. That's what he says. And what does he say about this God to whom we offer this word of praise? What does this God, what does it do? What can this God do for you? And, and, in, and in a real way, when you think about it, this is the summation, I think, of everything Paul wrote to him about God. So all nations and... and, and uh, well, what's the first thing he says? Believe and obey. What's that? Believe and obey. Well, yeah, we, I, but we're jumping a little ahead. What does he say? In verse 25, what does he, how does verse 25 start? Somebody that read verse 25. Call, uh, now, now, to, okay. ahead, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. Establish you, what is he talking about? Building up. Okay. Now he's talking about the one, and who is that one? Because he says, through the proclamation of Jesus Christ, so the one can't be Jesus, because he mentions him later. So who, God. You know, God. Now, to the God who can build you up, the God who can strengthen you, right? Well, good night. What has he been talking about? The whole, his whole letter. About what God has done, right? What God... That's right, that relationship, what God has done. And he's doing it through what? Christ. Doing it through the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And what is the proclamation of Jesus Christ? How does he define that? Revealing the mysteries. It's the revelation of the mysteries that were kept for a long time. But now revealed. And it's interesting how they're revealed. Through the commandments, through, writings. through prophets, commandments, prophetic writings, and of eternal love. Okay. Okay. and who who knows them now? It says in all nations. All nations. Word for nation in Greek is ethnos. Yeah, well, remember the Jews viewed the world as two groups: mm -hmm. Jews and everybody else. And what do they call everybody else? The, the ethnoi. Gentiles. We translated Gentile. But it was the ethnoi. It was the, the Jews and the ethnoi. The nations. Everybody else. And, and what is Paul doing here? By using that word, ethnoi. By using nations. United. Through prophetic writings. What, what prof okay, yeah, yeah, what prophetic writings is he talking about? Old Testament. Jesus is the proclamation of the stuff that was revealed in the Old Testament that is now made known to everyone, everyone, including you Gentiles, because he's writing to an Ethnoi choice church, no, no, made known to you. So what has Paul done in that one sentence? He's brought together everybody, everybody the Jews with the prophetic writing and the Ethnoi that know them now. Bang! That's what God has done. Isn't that what his whole letter's been about? You know, the work God has done? And how does, what's his last sentence? How does he conclude this? To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Everybody agree. Amen. 
And and this is the this is like capsulating, I think, the the his theology. It is about God, it is about what God has done through Jesus Christ, it is about the prophetic writings and the Gentiles understanding. This is what Paul is getting at. This is what he wants his Roman church to know. Bang! Any questions? Genesis next time. Genesis next time. <laughs> any any questions about anything in Romans? Oh, there's probably there's lots of questions. Well, think, think about it. This is, you know. I think Romans is probably the, since Paul has never been here, this becomes his theology. This becomes the foundation of his theology. Other places where he's been, he doesn't go into this depth because he's been there and, and taught it. So he kind of builds on what he's already taught. So you kind of have to infer what he's already said. This is what he believes. This is what Paul believes here in the book of Romans. Um, and this is how he wants Christians to apply it. Uh, so, Romans, great book. Next time, we're and we're not going to meet next week because I'm taking a week off, and I'm going to I'm going to do I'm going to do something fun next week. I am really going to do something just fun because you know you know we work and it's it's and I, I last time last vacation I took was back I think in the summer when I was, when I visited my father, you know, and so we're just going to do fun. I I've decided I told Demi. I've decided to take this week off to do my income tax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds yeah, cool. because because this is you know Lent is starts the next week, and I I want to I don't want to take time oh, during Pastor Ed, during Lent. You need somebody to tell you what fun is. <laughs> I really do, Sean. I really do. Words, true words, have never been spoken. Uh, do you need more than? Are you tired? Do you want? Do you want more than one week off? Uh, no, no, I, oh, okay. I, no, no, I don't. I, I no. Oh, be tired in this? Heck no. Heck no. Now you may be tired. If you like more, that's fine. No. Um, what what we'll do? Um, not next week, starting the following week. Uh, we'll we'll start looking at Genesis, and and we're going to talk about the um, the first two uh, chapters. Yeah, I think the first two. So read through the first two chapters of Genesis and, and just think about what's going on in those first two chapters of Genesis. And I'll, when we meet in two weeks, I'll tell you how, how I'm going to approach it and I'm going to encourage you to approach it at least while we study it. You don't have to approach it if, later if you don't want to. It's just, I think, a way to get more out of it um, and, and sort of what I personally believe in. in uh, in it. So, okay. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for guiding us through Romans. Uh, although it's a lot of stuff in here, and we we probably because we're we're limited, uh, we probably aren't going to take it all with us. Help us to sort of take a, the the fundamentals that uh, it's really about you and and not about us. Uh, at least in terms of our relationship with you. Remind us too, though, it is about us as we consider how we should live together, both with our brothers and sisters in the body and with those outside. So help us to take both those seriously, our relationship with you and your call for us to love those around us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you.